before Chapo's escape, every high level official in Mexico's government from the president on down said that it would be unforgivable if he got away again. They said that it would be impossible. Hi everyone, I'm Daniel Hernandez, Mexico Bureau Chief for Vice News. I'm here on the line to take your questions. Hey Daniel, thanks for coming on the show, man. Uh, it's great to have you here. We've got a good lineup of folks who want to talk to you and uh, let's just get it started. How do, you, how do you feel about that? Sounds great, let's do it. <laughs> let's say hey to Ricardo then. <clears throat> hey Ricardo. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you, hola? I'm doing great, thank you. So um, I have a few questions that I want to ask you and um, I mean, first off, I guess it begins by talking about El Chapo, which obviously is a topic that it's on everybody's mouth and it's, you know, recurring. And well, what do you have uh, to say or what is your opinion? Because, you know, everything has been said in news reports and everything. But what is your opinion regarding his second escape? And and I guess let's just take it from there and then, you know. Yeah, well, uh, the second escape by Joaquin El Chapo Guzman was uh, something that no one uh, would have predicted, but at the same time, everyone in, in a certain way could have predicted because uh, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman is super well known uh, for uh, using tunnels to smuggle drugs uh, across the border. He was also known for using tunnels to escape authorities uh, when they tried to capture him in Culiacán just before they got him in Mazatlán. Uh, Sinaloa. So uh, when this news occurred uh, on July 11th uh, that this individual managed to escape from a maximum security prison in Mexico using a tunnel, uh, we raced over there with the crew to try to get a closer look. And uh, we did go down there. Uh, it's coming in a documentary on Vice News soon. And it is pretty, uh, pretty spectacular uh, uh, structure, I got to say. I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, um uh, among, I mean, uh, apart from it being spectacular, do you think it just went unnoticed that, you know, throughout the whole building process of, of the tunnel? Or do you think like some people are actually now saying and it's just not um, it's not only uh, conspiracy theory or anything like that, but it's it's actually been in the media that it was a show. I mean, is there any hard evidence to present either of the two points, like either it being unnoticed or it being a show? Mm hmm. I think that's the key question right now. Uh, Mexico's government is uh, permitting uh, reporters to go down and look at the tunnel. They're also letting reporters to look at the prison cell side, but they haven't let anyone run all the way through. They say that it's dangerous. You know, this tunnel is not reinforced. It's, it's like a hueco. It's a hole in the ground, uh, 62 feet below from where the cell is and about 25 to 30 feet from where the escape house is. That's where uh, I went down with the Vice News crew. Uh, to check it out. We checked out uh, the motorbike, uh, we saw the railing, uh, we saw the ventilation system, the electricity system, the generator. But at the end of the day, we haven't been able to fully confirm that it connects all the way to the cell. And it also does raise questions that you mentioned, Ricardo, that, uh, you know, why didn't this generate noise? Why weren't there any signs? Why wasn't there any suspicion that this was going on? And if there was, well, who was aware um, who was maybe bribed by El Chapo or threatened by him or his associates in order to permit for this uh, tunnel uh, to be constructed. So right now there is this uh, back and forth between conspiracy theorists, let's say, and between the hard, hard evidence that we've seen up until this point, which is basically two different ends, two, two tunnels, uh, but no proof yet that they fully connect. Right. And this definitely, you know, has been a low blow to our current administration. And in your opinion, uh, what do you think that this will, you know, uh, compound it to all of the other things that are happening in, in Mexican, you know, not just politics, but, you know, society? What do you think is the, the short term effect um, of, of this, you know, this escape? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're saying, I'm saying, this is like another embarrassing, yeah. uh, uh, really uh, unfortunate thing that has happened uh, in the country. Before Chapo's escape, every high level official in Mexico's government from the president on down said that it would be unforgivable 
uh, if he got away again. They said that it would be impossible. Uh, the United States wanted uh, Joaquin Guzman extradited immediately. On June 25th, actually, um, it was revealed after the escape that on June 25th, the U.S. put in another request, and, the, and Mexico was apparently responding and maybe putting into motion an extradition for uh, Joaquin Guzman. It didn't happen, of course, before uh, he escaped. Well, this is a huge embarrassment. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's coincidental that uh, Guzman uh, escaped right as Peña Nieto, the president, Enrique Peña Nieto, uh, was traveling to Paris with more than 440 guests uh, to, you know, do the same trip that he did to the UK a few months ago. And uh, many of the foreign trips that he takes are in order to promote Mexico's brand, uh, to promote investment in Mexico. So it kind of uh, makes it seem like the priorities uh, were misplaced or he was kind of leaving, uh, leaving the home base at a critical time. Uh, so I don't know. It's up to Mexico's government to respond. Um, obviously, they see this as an embarrassment. A lot of reporters in the initial press conferences were asking the National Security Commissioner and the Interior Secretary, Miguel Angel Osorio Chong, if they were going to resign. They say they're not going to resign. Um, in a moment of crisis, it's not when you step down. But this is the worst or the most difficult challenge, I think, that Mexico's government and this particular administration has faced in these in these three years since they came into office right well one last thing and I just want to hear your opinion really bluntly what do you think about Mexico at this point in time well uh, you know Mexico is this constant contradiction It is both uh, wonderful and beautiful and 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 dark and, and, and nightmarish at times. It's really hard to reconcile uh, these two faces of the country. Um, you're living there and your daily life involves uh, wonderful food and culture and people and, 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 and in many ways a very free and open society. And then you turn around and look at the newspapers and, it's, and, and the headlines and the news are, are horrible, the violence the lack of justice, uh, the disasters that occur uh, in different points of the country for different reasons. Um, I'm really unsure. I don't want to um, promote constantly this negative portrait, excuse me, of, of the country. Uh, but at the same time, it would be uh, you know, negligent of me as a reporter to not focus on, on these tragedies and on these horrors Absolutely. that people are are facing on a daily basis. So uh, we'll see. You know, Mexico is, is, is this place that um, constantly surprises you and just when you think you know it can't get any weirder or darker or more complex something in the country happens that makes you just go how is this possible <laughs> yeah that's true well thanks and thanks, uh, Ricardo. take care take care yeah Ricardo thanks for coming on man so <laughs> um, Daniel we got a bunch of questions coming in on Twitter and I want to start with this one um, that we got actually yesterday um, this is from Big Daddy um, Big Daddy wants to know um, who and how the hell did they make that tunnel? Hey, Big Daddy. Uh, very good question. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, uh, the Sinaloa cartel is uh, a, a super skilled at uh, creating tunnels, particularly along the San Diego uh, Tijuana border. They use these to move the marijuana, the cocaine, the methamphetamine, and heroin into the United States um, and further afield. Um, uh, there has been uh, some examinations of these tunnels, and, and really they're quite remarkable. Um, the ventilation systems, uh, the depth um, that is required to build this. Um, obviously, you need highly skilled engineers and architects to make these um, uh, tunnels happen. So when people uh, have saw, saw this most recent tunnel there at the Altiplano prison in the state of Mexico, it was in a way kind of not surprising if you know anything about uh, Guzman and the Sinaloa cartels. Um, uh, use of tunnels. It does, of course, raise a lot of questions. Uh, did anyone hear noises? Uh, was there any indication that this was happening? Uh, you know, uh, uh, satellite imagery shows that the escape house that was used to connect the prison and the tunnel out uh, was uh, st uh, they started constructing it almost immediately after uh, he went into this facility in February um, of last year. So obviously it was a very sophisticated uh, operation. And then it has this kind of like Indiana Jones-like uh, element. Uh, you have uh, this uh, adapted motorbike um, uh, you know, on this railing. 
uh, that authorities say Guzman used in order to speed ahead, just in case if anyone was following him uh, down the tunnel, he was already on a bike uh, and moving to the end of the tunnel. And, and according to the uh, authorities, uh, he was smashing light bulbs along the way in order uh, to darken the path of anyone who might be pursuing him. Uh, so this is a guy who is uh, very well trained in, in knowing how to uh, uh, escape and use tunnels uh, to his advantage. Cool. So thanks, Big Daddy, for that question. And thanks for that Twitter handle, too. <laughs> so we've got another Skype caller for you. Let's say it is Scott Jones. I think Scott's calling us from London. Is that right, Scott? It is, yes. Hi. Hi, Scott. How are you doing? You okay? Good. Thank you. Good, good, good. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but, but firstly, uh, just a, a quick little um, thanks. Uh, we don't actually here in London uh, get much news with regards to Mexico or that region um, at all. It's only because of things like Vice and TYT, kind of like new media. Right. That we actually have any idea of what's going on over there. So uh, this is quite a new story to me. Um, Thank you. I suppose following on from what uh, Ricardo brought up, uh, a simpler question is what seems strange to me is why was this chap in what looks like a very lovely, cushy individual cell with a bathroom and considering the charges that are up against him and, and the extradition with America, right. they quite still life in that prison. Uh, great question. Uh, Chapo's uh, first time in a maximum uh, uh, security prison in Mexico was in Puente Grande in the state of Jalisco. Uh, he escaped from that in 2001. Um, initially, officials said it was in a laundry cart, which seemed uh, quite implausible because as uh, several journalists uh, later revealed, including uh, Anabel Hernandez and uh, uh, Jesus Lemus, uh, showed that he um, was probably got out of that prison with the help of uh, guards, officials, and probably also uh, the warden. Um, in that prison, uh, uh, allegedly, he had uh, constant access to cell phones. He had uh, constant access uh, to prostitutes and to visitors. Uh, he would throw lavish parties. He also uh, ate uh, great uh, gourmet uh, food. Excuse me. So inside these facilities, uh, Chapo Guzman uh, had kind of the good life. Uh, you know, when I look at this new uh, prison, I've never seen uh, uh, photo photos of uh, the Puente Grande uh, cell. This prison uh, does look um, austere, maybe, uh, but um, if you were to look at, compare that maybe to uh, maximum security cells uh, that we've seen in the United States, uh, uh, maybe not so much. I mean, there in Altiplano, he had a window. He did, as you mentioned, have this uh, shower. Um, uh, he, has, he had his bed, obviously, a little desk. Um, but the shower itself in the facility, um, you know, there's mold there in the floor around the photographs of, 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 of the hole that he used uh, allegedly to get out. Um, we've also interviewed in the past few days, myself and uh, our vice news crew there in Mexico City, um, uh, ex-prisoners from both of these prisons. And they say that it is an extremely strict environment that they enter you, that they enter the cells where you're at at random hours of the day, uh, strip search prisoners. Uh, they use little devices and listening devices uh, to check the perimeter of the cell, check all the walls. That is to say that if this tunnel uh, was built unnoticed, it is uh, implausible given what we know about the behavior of prison officials. Uh, the shower, for example, what was uh, Joaquin Guzman uh, doing, kind of pacing back and forth before entering the shower? Any kind of unusual behavior uh, 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 raises alarms uh, with the officials who are watching on the closed uh, uh, circuit television. And uh, some of these ex-prisoners told uh, Vice News in Mexico um, that uh, if you, if you're, even if you're not moving for a few minutes, they get alarmed and they come and check on you. So that raises questions like why was, why didn't anyone notice? Why didn't anyone go get, go in there and check on him? Also, officials admitted in the past few days that um, 18 minutes passed from the moment that they lose visual contact uh, with Chapo Guzman. Uh, up until when uh, guards went and, and to check on him. So obviously there's some uh, negligence or just, uh, you know, maybe incompetence or just may maybe there was all part of uh, one plan to let him free and to let him have a head start, let's say, against anyone who might be chasing him. Okay. Seems, um, seems a bit good fellows. Yeah. Good fellows. <laughs> 
as such with regards to his lifestyle. Right. Um, the, the other question that I had, which is, is a bit broader, and um, again, I'm not from that part of the world or that continent, but um, on paper, at least, um, Mexico should be a successful country if you look at its exports, its uh, natural resources, and it clearly isn't. Um, it clearly isn't a successful country. It, it, it appears to be a failed state. And everything is in place with regards to the democratic system. It's basically the same as America, judicial system, etc., etc. So I suppose my very broad question is, why is it such a failed state? And why is it in the mess that it appears to be? And it, it kind of on paper, it should, should be doing a lot better than it is. Right. You know, those two words are um, sort of like uh, the death toll for, uh, for the government. They hate hearing uh, this term. There was this leaked U.S. Uh, Defense Department uh, document, I think it was around 2008, uh, in which uh, uh, Pentagon officials sort of suggested that Mexico could be a failed state uh, like Pakistan or something like that. Um, that's something that Mexico's government does not want to hear, does not want to put in the public eye. But despite all their best efforts to promote this idea of Mexico as this sort of flourishing uh, world uh, figure, um, it's true what you say. It's, it's really incongruent, um, the fact that Mexico has so much natural resources, uh, has so much uh, potential, let's say. Um, and there are some good signs. It has a pretty uh, robust uh, industrial sector. Um, obviously, um, the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement in 1994 permitted uh, Canadian and U.S. companies to set up shop and take advantage of cheap labor in Mexico um, uh, as a way to balance out um, uh, the competition posed uh, by China. Um, Mexico has more um, uh, trade agreements with other countries than any other country in the world. Um, and yet, Mexico is uh, uh, half of the country lives in poverty. Um, half of the country uh, does not have access uh, to many of the things that you know people in developed or first world countries, uh, let's say, see as, as pretty normal. Um, it's very frustrating to look at the scenario. It's very difficult to understand why Mexico is unable to sort of spread the fruits uh, that it has uh, to the entire population. The other side of that, of course, is the lack of justice. Um, you know, something like two percent of crimes uh, get convicted. Uh, most crimes never even get reported. Uh, uh, there is no way of knowing how bad the crime situation is because people simply do not report to officials uh, when uh, maybe even something petty as such as a robbery or, or a home robbery all the way to a kidnapping. People would prefer um, negotiating with kidnappers to free a relative who might be uh, held for ransom than going to police because a lot of people fear that police themselves are the criminals or police themselves are the problem. So that's what Mexico has to tackle. It has to address the rule of law and it has to um, address the fact that it's so unequal and so much wealth is concentrated in such a small percentage of the population. I think those are probably the two factors uh, that prevent Mexico from, from reaching that potential that I think anyone else in the world can see as, as there and just not uh, tapped, you know. Okay, great. I suppose um, at least there is some positivity with regards to there is potential. Right. And Knows maybe they can turn it around, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, who knows? But um, once again, uh, thank you very much, and to obviously your crew for highlighting these things and the various different stories because they're not something that, at least in Britain or Europe, you tend to get reported on. They're very important stories. So thanks to you and your crew for that. Thanks, Scott. Cheers. Yeah, Scott. Thanks a lot for coming on, man. So, um, Daniel, we got a couple more tweets I want you to take a look at. Um, these two are kind of hand in hand. Uh, Bart wants to know, uh, where is his, and I think he's talking about El Chapo's <coughs> money, and how are those drug profits uh, able to be spent uh, without people finding them? And then uh, we also got this tweet from Dustin, who wants to know, how easy is it for cartels to buy off uh, local and federal police in Mexico? So I'm curious your thoughts on those two questions. Cool. Uh, yeah. Um, this first question by Dustin, uh, I think, is... Uh, pretty easy to answer. I mean, uh, the cartels use fear and money. I mean, they, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, simply uh, threaten uh, officials, buy them off. They offer them uh, more money than their salaries do, and that's another huge problem that I think 
in my opinion, is pretty easy to address. Uh, municipal police forces in Mexico often have to buy their own equipment, sometimes even in, in some cases their own weapons, uh, in order to do their jobs. Uh, this is also a complaint by firefighters in many parts of Mexico. So the government could uh, easily um, address uh, sort of the threat posed uh, by a cartel, uh, by cartel threats and by cartel uh, bribes by maybe raising the wages of, of uh, public servants who are there to, to serve uh, the population. Uh, of the country, but really when you look at someone who has so much money, who is named uh, one of the richest people in the world by Forbes uh, magazine, uh, someone who's responsible for something like 25% of all the drugs sent to the United States, uh, a conservative estimate of, of $3 billion uh, uh, in annual profits, how can you compete with that? You know what I mean? And so that's kind of the basic uh, problem there. It's, it's uh, simply very easy to buy off uh, local officials. In terms of where Guzman's money is located, well, um, as our vice news reporters in Mexico uh, have, have shown us, uh, a lot of that money is laundered, is cleaned in Mexico in the form of uh, real estate, uh, restaurants, uh, bars, clubs, uh, any kind of business that, that can be set up in order to launder this money and sort of cycle it through uh, the system. Of course, banks are also involved and banks are also uh, responsible. The United States has fined uh, several transnational banks uh, and convicted uh, banks uh, for uh, laundering money for the cartels, and in particular, the Sinaloa cartel. So that's another huge issue that has to be addressed sort of binationally. Uh, you know, the role of banks and the role of these uh, huge uh, transnational operations in moving that money back and forth and permitting the cartel to buy weapons and, and to uh, bribe officials with millions and millions of dollars. Nice, man. So uh, I hope that answers uh, the questions of, I think that was Dustin and Bart. So Dustin and Bart, thanks for your questions. Um, we got some more questions on Skype. So say to Brooke, who is calling us from San Diego. Is that right, Brooke? That's right. Ah, good. Hi, Brooke. Hi. So I had a bunch of questions about Chapo Guzman that you've already answered. So instead, I'm going to ask you um, something I've been wondering. In your opinion, um, there's a real hole in coverage in the United States media about Mexico. Vice is one of the few places that actually does do Mexico coverage. And I'm wondering if you have any kind of opinion on what makes that hole happen. You know, why is there such a lack of information out there? You, you hear about this kind of really like glamorous cartel or like scary cartel news and then you hear about crime and then you hear about beats. That's about it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good point, and thank you for um, taking note of that. I, I do feel that here at Vice News, we want to um, cover the stuff that maybe other uh, people aren't covering. My personal opinion is that Mexico is extremely important to, Mexi uh, to, to the U.S., and news out of Mexico is more important because these countries are, are merging and meshing in, in ways uh, that we are, aren't even understanding right now. Um, uh, Latinos are now the largest uh, a minority in the United States, and Mexican Americans make up the largest chunk of that. So more and more Americans have uh, Mexican neighbors, Mexican classmates, uh, Mexican American as well. Um, I think that's that's what sort of drives our coverage, in in my view. We want uh, to uh, show people the stories that that they might want to know, that they might. Uh, feel have something to do with people in their community, in their school, in their church, in their neighborhood. Um, at the same time, we, I, I feel like uh, a lot of people, as you say, do want to just focus on sort of the spectacular glamorous news like the Chapo escape, right? Or a horrible um, uh, cartel massacre maybe. But there's a lot of kind of like everyday news uh, that is also uh, similar to kind of the things that happen uh, in the U.S. If there's a hurricane, for example, some kind of a natural disaster, um, and also sort of like big city stories uh, related, uh, you know, to crime, to transportation, those are all things I think that uh, reflect uh, the fact that Mexico is a very complex place. It's urban, it's rural, it's very wealthy, very poor. So uh, a lot of times in those contradictions uh, and in those kind of fissures in the news, you can find really interesting stories. Uh, but is it, it is a good question. A lot of people, I think, uh, see Mexico as sort of like the backyard 
yard, you know, or the, the shed in the back where you go in to get what you need, but don't really address maybe the actual needs that are there. And so, uh, but thank you for noticing that, Burke. That's something that we're trying to address in our coverage here at Vice. Well, and my next question is um, kind of fitting into more to what you were asking or what you were talking about earlier. Um, it, Mexico being called a failed state and, and having this, you know, not only the negative coverage, but, but also the, the hold of the cartels. Uh, Plan Merida, where does that fit into everything? Great uh, thing to bring up. Uh, Plan Merida uh, or the Merida Initiative uh, was signed uh, by uh, George W. Bush and Felipe Calderon. Uh, it's meant to uh, allow the U.S. Uh, to target uh, the, the issue in Mexico by sending uh, money, uh, hardware, uh, weapons, helicopters, also training, and a small section of it, or, or a chunk of it, is supposedly aimed at, at helping uh, uh, bolster up and, um, and improve and reform Mexico's uh, legal and judicial institutions, which are really in a, in a dire, uh, dire state. Uh, Plan Merida, or the Merida Initiative, has brought, uh, I think, more than uh, $5 billion. I'm not sure. I have to check that figure. But uh, more than $5 billion uh, over these past uh, seven, eight years. Um, that's a question I think that we need to uh, pose to U.S to the US side, to US officials, how successful has this been? Uh, we've heard in some of the grumbling of uh, unnamed US officials who have spoken uh, to US news outlets since the escape of Joaquin Guzman that they're kind of like shrugging and saying, well, if we're sending Mexico all this money and we're sending Mexico all this help, and yet they're unable to keep a guy uh, as dangerous or as significant as Joaquin Guzman is prison, in prison, well, what's the use? And I think that is another question uh, that eventually has to be answered on the Mexican side. Uh, you know, they have to prove uh, that uh, they are a worthy investment, let's say, a worthy security investment uh, for the United States. Because the United States has sent so much money to Colombia, for example, another kind of parallel uh, case. And, and Colombia sort of hailed as this very successful uh, um, security um, uh, assistance uh, case for, for the United States. So we'll see. I think all of that is really up in the air right now since Guzman's escape. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Brooke. I really appreciate you coming on to uh, ask those questions. So, uh, Daniel, we got, go figure, more questions, this time from Twitter. Um, and this is a first for us. Uh, Evan has some questions, but he couldn't get it into 140 characters. So what he did was he took a screenshot oh. of some notes that he took on his phone, and here they are. So he wants to know, while well, you were investigating uh, your femicide piece, um, about femicides in Mexico, uh, did any femicides actually take place? And he also wants to know if you think that the prevalence of femicides in Mexico has more to do with uh, narco culture or is this a, a larger societal issue? What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, thanks for that question, um, Evan. Yes, we did. Uh, our crew uh, in Mexico and myself went um, and spent uh, more than a year investigating uh, the question of uh, the violent killings of women, and, and we focused on one state, the state of Mexico, the home state, actually, of the current president, Enrique Peña Nieto. Uh, this is a, a controversial a topic and a controversial, a controversial term. Uh, you know, we don't say menicide. Uh, the majority of homicides in the country, of course, are male. Uh, but a femicide is, is important, and it's an issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, because it involves a horrible uh, violence before the murder. A, a woman is killed uh, in, uh, for reasons related to her gender. Um, uh, they face torture, they face mutilation, uh, bodies are dumped in canals, uh, in rivers, uh, on roadsides, and nothing happens. Uh, no one investigates, uh, no one is arrested, uh, and, and no one, of course, is convicted. And so this is kind of a silent crisis, this silent epidemic that is really um, uh, just a horrible nightmare, and it's happening right in the ring uh, of uh, Mexico City in the suburbs uh, where uh, many of um, sort of the lower middle class or poor workers live and commute every day um, into the city. 
Uh, yes, uh, there were several instances when we went out there, we'd pick up a local paper and we'd see another horrible uh, photograph of a crime scene involving a, a female homicide uh, victim. But beyond that, nothing happens. No one cares, no one investigates. Uh, after our documentary, actually, the governor of the state of Mexico, Eruviel Avila, uh, finally uh, responded uh, after months and months of, of campaigning and protests uh, by uh, advocates in the state of Mexico and said he was going to institute a gender alert in order to focus on uh, these kinds of crimes. Well, we'll see once that is in place if it will have any actual effect. Um, our documentary focused on a case of a young woman who was most likely killed by her husband uh, who was a judicial police officer um, in the state of Mexico. So the collusion with authorities is a big issue that is also not uh, being addressed. Um, to answer uh, Evan's second question, um, I think that is more of an intangible. Um, you know, how is narco culture affecting uh, this wave of violence against women? Or does it have to do more uh, with uh, the culture of machismo uh, that has been prevalent in Mexico for so many uh, decades and years? So it's, it's interesting and we have to, um, you know, really uh, hold up the mirror, I think, in Mexico and, and address uh, maybe the cultural uh, factors that are involved in the violent killings of women and the lack of justice for them and, and for their families. Well, yeah, um, I, that's a serious issue and I'm glad that uh, the team at Vice News is covering it. Um, so thanks for leaving that coverage down there. But, you know, we've got some more people uh, to ask you questions and this is our last Skype caller. Uh, but let's say to Kieran, last but not least. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Kieran. How are you? So I'm currently based out of Colombia, so my question is going to involve Colombia. Many believe that Colombia is on the verge of a peace agreement with the Marxist FARC insurgency, an armed group which has violently fought against the government for over 50 years. The FARC just agreed to sign a unilateral ceasefire, which is the sixth unilateral ceasefire mm -hmm. that has occurred since its existence. But despite the fact that all previous efforts have failed, um, and new sources have framed this ceasefire in a more positive light. In what ways do you think a successful peace agreement and resolution with the FARC will affect Mexico's current conflict or inspire change across borders? So, for example, some argue that FARC actors have trained members of Mexican drug cartels and that there are strong links between Mexican cartels and the FARC. What do you think about this and how will FARC demobilization impact Mexico? That is a super good question. I'm super um, glad that you've asked it. Um, the situation in Colombia is really critical right now, and in my personal opinion, I think it's one of the most important stories anywhere. Uh, the country is on the verge, maybe, of ending this conflict uh, with this guerrilla. Uh, the FARC uh, have been uh, in this asymmetrical war with Colombia's government. Uh, since at least 1964 when they were formed. Uh, they're kind of like three out of six points it, it is um, solved in order to um, possibly end uh, the war. Even so, uh, Colombian voters would have to approve the peace deal in a referendum, uh, right? And even if that happens, Colombia would still have to some, come, come to some kind of peace agreement with the ELN, uh, which is another guerrilla. But as you point out, uh, the FARC have long ago sort of shed, uh, you know, their ideological or, or maybe even uh, a moral sort of impulse uh, in their insurgency. They are involved in drug trafficking and they are probably involved uh, with Mexican uh, uh, cartels or traffickers. Um, we have a reporter in Bogota who's been doing great stuff, Joel Parkin, on this deal. And I think it's very important for Mexico to look at Colombia and also for the U.S. to look at Colombia in relation to Mexico. As we mentioned earlier, the U.S. Uh, supports Colombia's government and Colombia's military uh, through Plan Colombia. And now the U.S. supports Mexico and Mexico's government uh, through Plan uh, Merida. It will become a question of, of, of if uh, Mexico can look at Colombia and then look at itself. Uh, you know, 220,000 people have been killed in a conservative estimate in Colombia's war over 50 years. 
In Mexico, in less than 10 years, 120,000 people, conservatively as well, have been killed in this conflict. And yet, Mexico's government and, US's, and the US government doesn't even use the term war uh, anymore. They've, uh, they're trying to kind of uh, whitewash or gloss over the conflict that is occurring in the country and affecting so many people's uh, lives. Um, that's something that we're trying to do in our coverage, uh, focus on Colombia and remind people that there's another country in the region uh, that has been living in conflict. Generations of Colombians, such as yourself, uh, have, have never seen peace. Uh, and, and so um, I can imagine that there's only this hope, although great skepticism, uh, towards this deal. Uh, as I understand it, many Colombians, um, they w of course want peace and want um, stability and, and the prosperity that uh, Colombia has been building and enjoying in, in recent years, uh, but many people don't believe uh, that peace uh, could be achieved. I, I personally think that uh, Mexico's government and Mexico's leaders and the people involved in, in trying to resolve uh, the issue of violence in Mexico uh, should look at Colombia and understand that although we may not be dealing in Mexico with um, sort of a Marxist uh, uh, ideological insurgency, uh, we're dealing basically with um, uh, business people with guns who are just trying to protect their businesses uh, of trafficking, but the effects of this conflict are the same, uh, disappearance. Uh, disappearances, displaced people, forced disappearances. Um, uh, Colombia has the highest population of people who are internally displaced um, uh, in the region. It's up there like with Syria. Mexico Second has highest in the world, highest in the world six, uh, almost six million, isn't that right? Um, Mexico has documented 280,000 people who are internally displaced, people pushed off their lands by the cartels or by uh, different uh, uh, organized crime groups. That's probably a very low figure. Uh, myself and a vice news crew actually went to one of these uh, refugee camps and it's just, uh, it's just impossible to um, uh, sort of reconcile the image of people uh, pushed out of their communities uh, by drug gangs, uh, you know, in the country directly south of the United States. And it's something that has to be addressed. Uh, the effects of these conflicts, uh, uh, Colombia will have a truth commission. Both sides have agreed that once a deal is passed, there will be a reconciliation, you know, a truth commission like they had in Argentina after the dictatorship or in South Africa after apartheid. And uh, Mexico at some point will have to need that as well. But first, Mexico just has to acknowledge that, that it is in a state of war uh, like Colombia's, an asymmetrical, low-intensity war, but that affects millions and millions of people uh, nonetheless. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, you mentioned also the referendum and society needing to approve of the peace agreement that will take place in La Habana. And um, so my question is, Despite the need of this referendum, and there remains a strong, strong opposition to the peace agreement, as you said, here within Colombia. There's international hope for it, but within Colombia, the youth in particular aren't involved in the process, and there's just major pessimism. What do you think we can do to include Colombian youth and to create optimism about the process? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. I mean, um you're right, there is this pessimism. When I went uh, to Colombia last year, I was just a couple of days in, in Bogotá, and I was trying to ask uh, people you know, my age, are you excited? Like, imagine, you know, like your parents had war, you might see peace in your country, and everyone was just like, no, like nothing's gonna change, nothing's gonna happen, it's gonna be the same old thing, and there's a lot of, uh, understandable bitterness. Uh, you know, everyone in Colombia that I met had some story of, 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 of being uh, victimized uh, by the conflict, a relative killed, uh, a relative losing their lands or property uh, because of the guerrilla. Um, so there is, how do you get over that? How do you, um, uh, you know, forgive? Uh, how, how do you move on? How do you come to terms uh, with the violence, especially if you've been uh, directly affected? Um, 
I'm hopeful. Uh, I would like you know to see uh, uh, peace in Colombia, but we also have to be aware that the interests that are now involved uh, regionally, internally, uh, there is also sort of a vested interest in in in, in war because you know war is an economy. War makes uh, some people money, you know, and eventually all of that will have to be. Uh, filtered through also in Mexico. We're going to have to come to terms in Mexico with what's going on and eventually there will have to be uh, you know a reconciliation also between uh, the different groups and the victims. Uh, it's interesting you know when protesters go out in Colombia and sort of like uh, uh, whole demonstrations for the victims of the conflict. Uh, we cover that and when people also protest and say you know no um, they want to give uh, amnesty and political participation to the FARC if a peace deal uh, is signed. And a lot of people are very opposed to that because they blame the FARC uh, for so much violence and murder and for so much displacement. Uh, so that's where we uh, as societies, uh, I feel, have to sort of um, you know, challenge ourselves. Can we get over the war? Can we get over the conflict? And can we reach a point of reconciliation. That's why I think it's, at the end of the day, um, an exciting and a very interesting and urgent and very relevant story. Okay. Um, you cut out for a little bit, so I missed the last part of your answer, but I, I have one more question about Mexico. May I ask that as well? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, so Mexico has rapidly has rapidly advanced gay rights and same-sex mm. marriage is now legal in many many parts of the country like Mexico City, Chihuahua, and Quintana Roo. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, what makes these regions different from areas like the Yucatan where same-sex marriage is banned? Yeah, super good question. Uh, Quintana Roo and Yucatan are both on the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, Quintana Roo is more, um, I, whether you, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's like, kind of like where the Mayan Riviera is, uh, Tulum, Cancun, it's more touristy. They were also probably thinking in terms of the kind of uh, tourism dollars that uh, um, uh, legalized uh, gay marriage could maybe bring, you know, probably a lot of people would want to go down there and maybe get married uh, on the beautiful uh, uh, Mayan coast. Uh, Mexico City is kind of, you know, this bubble within Mexico. It's like the New York to the US or the London, you know, to the UK. It's where uh, there's uh, more liberal laws, more progressive laws. But the other states that have had, um, uh, have passed uh, uh, gay rights laws are not exactly, you know, liberal or, or anything like that. They're often uh, rural states. Uh, far from the center of the country. It's really interesting to see um, how these rights have advanced. Last month, uh, the Supreme Court basically said that de facto gay marriage is legal across the country. And uh, the individual states, Mexico's 31 states, have to sort of individually um, uh, legislate uh, that into law. Uh, but basically, it has been determined that uh, uh, same-sex marriage is legal across the country. Um, the U.S. influence might have something uh, to do with that, but at the same time, Mexico has always kind of had like a very open attitude uh, towards uh, sexuality and, and towards gay life and, and gay identity. And it was interesting when I've traveled uh, further south uh, on assignment for Vice News, I haven't found that sort of same kind of climate in many countries except maybe for Buenos Aires and, and Argentina. Um, so it will be interesting to see how, you know, the, the effect of the U.S. legalization of these laws down into Mexico and now how Mexico might, uh, how that sort of like climate or attitude or change uh, in, in climate could affect further down south uh, into Central and South America. Yeah, that's fascinating. It would be interesting to see a program on that in yeah. the future. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. All right. So, hey, Daniel, you know, I think we have made it to the end of the show. That's it. OK, yeah, that's it. You didn't, I don't think any of us are going to get fired. Uh, so, uh, why don't you say goodbye to the people at home? Well, thanks a lot uh, for uh, coming on today on On The Line. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone for uh, their questions and, and tweets. And I want to give a big shout out uh, to all our crew, our editors and producers at the Vice Mexico office in Mexico City. Follow all our coverage, please, on vicenews.com and on Twitter, on Facebook. Thanks a lot. El compañero Diego recibió una llamada por telefónica donde lo estaban amenazando y le dijo que él tenía la orden de matar toda la gente inocente y que nosotros nos largáramos porque si no íbamos nos iba a cargar la verga. Apparently we are being watched uh, by someone else. Um, 
So it just kind of gets to the question of who's really in charge here. Al parecer, según es el dueño del encargado de la plaza de aquí, yo ni lo conozco, no sé. Pero así lo mientan ahí en el teléfono. 